Now, today is Father's Day, of course, and uh, I will be paying more attention to the fathers in this message, but the message, I'm trusting God to speak to all of us with the message, not just the fathers. You know, the Bible says that God loves the world so much that he sent Jesus to come and die for us, and it is because he loves humanity. He loves, hum he loves every human being that he created, and he came to die for them so that all of them will eventually come to glory. So God loves humanity. But out of that humanity, God loves a special category of people. And he, in fact, designates them and calls them my people. He said, they are my people, and I am their God. Now, don't be deceived. God is not the father of everybody. Don't ever make the mistake of things. Well, people say that, oh, Father God is the father of all. No, 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 no. God is the creator of all humanity. He is the creator of all human beings, okay? But he is not the father of all human beings. In fact, some people, some Jews told Jesus that, oh, you know, we have God as our father. We have Abraham as our father. Jesus said, no, you are of your father, the devil. So it's not everybody who has been created by God that is a child of God. No, but they are creatures of God. They are creations of God, and God loves them, but he's not their father. So out of the humanity, God now calls out a group of people and says, okay, I'm going to be their God, I'm going to be their father, and they will be mine. He calls them my people, they will be my people, and I will be their God. Now he started with the Jews. He chose the Jewish race as his people, but then he now extends it to non-Jews, to any human being on the face of the planet who chooses to be one of his people by accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so he has this category of people that he calls my people. They are people who have given their lives to Jesus. They are the people who are born again. They are called the people of God. He calls them a peculiar people. He calls them a holy nation, a peculiar people. He said, I have set them apart to show forth my glory to the world. He said, that's the reason why I have set them apart. Now, listen to this. There's a third category of people that God has. And he wants you and I to belong to that category. And it is not everybody, even in the second category of God's people, that is in that third category. But that third category is where he wants everybody to belong. Everybody. They are the people after God's own heart. That's what he calls them. The people after his own heart. What, what does it mean to be after somebody's heart? What does it really mean? When you say somebody is after another person's heart, it means that fellow is compliant with the intent, with the will, and with the inclination of that fellow, of the other person. In other words, if I, if, when God says somebody is after my heart, it means he's saying that this person is compliant, is obedient to my intent. Anytime this fellow knows about my intent, he's always compliant. He wants to do it. He wants to obey it. He also loves, this fellow loves my will. This fellow is after my heart. Anytime this person recognizes my will with regard to something, he complies with my will. This fellow loves, he, he, he always thinks like me. He tries to do what I want to do. He is after my own heart. When God says somebody is after my heart, it means that fellow is in agreement with the inclinations of God. He's in agreement with all the proclivities and all the tendencies and all the idiosyncrasies and all the propensities of God. Whatever, whichever way God is seeking to go, whoever is after God's heart loves to follow it. So God says, such people that are always in agreement with my intent, that are always in agreement with my will, 
that are always seeking for ways to do what I want and the way I want to go, and they just want to follow me regardless of how they feel about it, regardless of whether they really want it or not, but just because I said, this is the right way, walk you in it. And they said, okay, sir, sure, I walk in it. Wow, said, this fellow is after my heart. That is the category, the third category of where God wants everybody to belong. And so today I'm going to share with you a man after God's own heart. Because it is Father's Day, that's why we call it a man. You may as well say a woman after God's own heart. You can say a child after God's own heart. But today is Father's Day, so let's concentrate on men. And we are going to look at some examples in Scripture. We are going to compare two people, two men. We're going to compare two men and see how one of them was rejected by God and the other one God says, after my heart. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts are perfect toward him so that he can show his great power in helping them. In other words, from this category, this third category, the Bible says those who are compliant with the will of God, with the intent of God, with the purposes of God, with the inclinations of God, that God is always looking for them, that his eyes are running to and fro, looking for them. From, the, from those who are born again. But there are some people out of those who are born again. You know, it's not everybody who is born again. It's not everybody who comes to church. It's not everybody who says, I am a Christian. I am born again. It's not everybody whose hearts are towards God. No. No, there are many Christians in church who, have, who don't want to have anything to do with the will of God. I mean, they despise the will of God. They despise the inclinations of God. They are not in agreement at all with the intent of God. When God says something in his word, oh, well, maybe, but they are, they, their heart is not there. They are not in agreement. Even though they are born again, they have given their life to Jesus. And yet, they just are not people after God's own heart. But God wants to get all of us to that place where we will be after his heart. Help me tell your neighbor, you will be after God's heart. After hearing this message today, the grace of God will be sufficient for you. God will touch your heart. And if you are a man in the house, say with me, I am a man after God's heart. By faith, I receive it today. The Bible says such people, God is looking for them. And why? Because he wants to show himself very strong on their behalf. He's looking for them. He wants to manifest his power on their behalf. That's what they get. That's the reward they get when your heart is perfect towards God. Let's just pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you this morning and we ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will speak through these lips of clay and minister life to your people. Father, you know that if you don't anoint these words, they will mean nothing and they will accomplish nothing in the lives of God's people. But I thank you that you have my mind, you have my mouth, you have my intellect, you have everything. Father, make them usable today, and let God's people receive. Let what we hear today be profitable unto us for time and for eternity. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, to be after God's heart does not mean sinlessness. When God says, I'm looking for those whose hearts are perfect towards me, perfection of heart, is, it has nothing to do with sinlessness. In fact, the Bible says, there is no man that sins not. No, not all have fallen short of the glory of God. All. The perfection that we have as born-again Christians and God's people, it is a perfection that Christ has. It is the righteousness of Christ that we are having. So when we say we are righteous people, it is because of Christ. It is not our own righteousness. The Bible says our own righteousness, they are like filthy rags before God. And so when we talk about perfection, when God talks about perfect heart, he's talking about 
hearts that are in agreement, that are in compliance with his intent, with his will, with his inclination, even when the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. They were praying with Jesus. The disciples were praying with him. Their spirit was willing, but they were sleeping. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak. But note that their flesh did not remain weak forever. These same people who could not pray for one hour with the Lord, they were the ones who, were, who, who sacrificed their lives. Peter said, crucify me upside down. I'm not fit to die the way my Lord Jesus died. Some of them were fried in oil. Some were cut asunder with sword. Some banished into, uh, in, uh, into islands. So they did not rem- their flesh did not remain weak forever. They continued to grow. So perfection is not sinlessness. But it means that your heart is willing. Your heart is accepting what God says. Your heart is willing. Your heart is accepting his will, his intent. Your heart, is, your heart is accepting all that. That's what perfection means. Now, there are two men in the Bible, Saul and David. And from their lives, you can see why God says David is a man after his own heart and Saul he has rejected. It's a long story, but we'll just identify some points because of time. Please put on the screen 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. The first thing, if you want to be a man after God's heart, a woman after God's heart, a child after God's heart, the first thing is obedience. Obedience. Your heart has to want to obey God. You must have a heart of obedience. Where you agree with God, obedience. Obedience. The Philistines had gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people at at the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Another transition says, quaking with fear. And he waited seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Samuel, the prophet had told him, wait for seven days, I will come. And so he waited seven days. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. His army, his soldier began to scatter because they were afraid. Everybody was hiding. Hey, prophet Samuel didn't come. What are we going to do? And Saul said, bring, me hither, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. I pray for you today that you have a heart that will obey God, that the enemy will not ensnare you in such a way that you will look back and say, why did I do it? The, pri- the prophet and the priest told him, wait for seven days. Wait for seven days. I'm coming. We know we need to do a sacrifice to the Lord in order to win this war. But don't worry. Wait for seven days. He waited for seven days. But the seventh day was not over yet. But because he saw that the soldiers scattered, they were, scattered, they were afraid. Saul became afraid. And because of that, he did not obey what he was told. He said, Bring me the animal for the sacrifice. And he offered the sacrifice himself against the law of God. It was not the place of the king to offer that sacrifice. It was not his place. It was for the prophet to come and do it. But it's because he was afraid, he went and did it. Now, see what happened. Put it back on the screen. And Samuel said, what have you done? 
And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed. That's a lie. The man came on the seventh day. He said seven days. Wait for seven days. Because the Bible says, as soon as he finished offering, Samuel came. So he was there on the seventh day. And that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself to force yourself. Me, you know that it was not right to do, but you did it anyway. I forced my, I, as I was doing it, I knew I shouldn't do this thing. I shouldn't be disobedient. This thing is not right. And what I will do, I forced myself to do it. You will not force yourself to do it. Amen. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. But now, Samuel told him, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because you have not kept that which the Lord commanded you. When you don't keep the commandment of God, when you don't obey the instructions of God, then you are not a person after God's heart. God wants us to be a man after his heart by keeping, by obeying his word. Put 1 Samuel 15 from verse 7. 1 Samuel 15 from verse 7. 1 Samuel 15 from verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites. This, this, that one was the first disobedience. Now this one now is the second disobedience. He disobeyed God again. God gave him another chance. Now he disobeyed God again. Okay? And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havila until you come to Shur that is over against Egypt. Uh-huh. Quickly. Let's go through it very fast. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, God said the instruction he was given is destroy everybody. And the reason why God said he should destroy everybody was because if he left anybody alive, they will come back and be a thorn in the flesh of Israel. They will come back and kill all their wives and kill all their children. So God said, better wipe them out now and give him the instruction. But he did not. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and they would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse that they, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord of the Samuel saying, it, it repents me. In other words, it grieves me. I regret. I regret that I have made Saul to be king. God will not regret that he has put you in a position. God will not look back and say, why did I bless this, my daughter? That will never be your portion. All the men here in the house, God will not regret making you the head of your home. Your home will not, your family will not go into captivity because of you. Because of you, evil will not befall your home. Yeah. And because the decisions that you make, the decisions you make on behalf of the family, you have a wife who is obedient, a Christian wife who says, you know what, God said I should submit unto my own husband as unto the Lord, even though I don't agree, let me submit. I, I pray for all men here today. Because you have an obedient wife, you will not bring evil upon her. Yeah. You will not bring evil upon your family. Yeah. Put back on the screen. It, uh, the children are helping me to shout that amen. Thank you. It, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul came to Camera, and behold, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. Now, hear what he said. I said the first thing is obedience. 
You are going to do the second thing now that God requires from somebody who is a man who is a man after God's heart. Obedience, true repentance, and godly sorrow. The second one. When you are confronted with your sin, how do you respond as a man after God's heart? If you, are not, if you don't respond the proper way, you are not a man or woman after God's heart. Now, they have confronted, now they are confronting Saul with his sin. See his response. And someone came to Saul and said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Did he perform the commandment of the Lord? But when he's telling him that I have performed it. And someone said, Okay, you have performed it? Okay, what does this bleaching of the sheep, what does that mean in my ears? God said, You wipe out everything, don't spare anything. But I'm hearing the bleatings of sheep and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear. And Saul said, They, not me, <laughs> it's not me, it's they. Uh, they. Tell people that it's not me, it's they. If you are a man after God's own heart, you don't deflect responsibility. You accept responsibility. A man after God's own heart does not look for excuses to justify what they have done. They own up. They man up. Put it on the screen. And Saul said, they have, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spare the best of the sheep. And of the oxen, as if the people didn't have any king, and the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. Did you see that? Ah, Samuel, what's your problem? The sheep and the goat, is it not for God that we are doing it for? Is it for us? It's for God, even though we will eat it, but it's for God. <laughs> they, they say it's for your God. He was trying to justify it. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When you were little in your own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? The day they were making Saul king, he was hiding. When they, chose the, when they were going to choose king, and the God, God said they should throw Lot, and they threw the Lot, they threw the Lot, it fell on his tribe. But who out of this big tribe are we going to give it to? The tribe of Benjamin. Who out of them? And then they threw it again. It fell on his own family. But who out of the family of Kish are we going to give it to? Then they threw it again. It fell on Saul. Then they were looking for him. He, went, he had gone somewhere to hide behind the baggage and the luggage. They were looking for Saul. Where is he? Where is Saul? Where is Saul? The day, you know that even in his own eyes, he did not, he knew that it was nothing, even in his own eyes. And, and somewhere said, Were you not little in your own sight? Was thou not made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord said, sent you on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He was still insisting. He was, help me ask your neighbor. I hope you are not like this man. <laughs> Something that is this obvious and you are still insisting. Hey, don't be afraid now. I'm the one that sent you. Why are you afraid? Tell, ask them. Don't be afraid. Ask your neighbor. I hope you are not like this man. Ask them. I, I sent you. Don't be afraid. I'm here. There is a proverb in Southwest in Nigeria where I call the Yoruba people. The Yoruba people say, look. You, are, you, don't get, you, don't, you, are, you should not be afraid of the person they sent you to. Be afraid of the person sending you. Yes. It's me you should be afraid of. Don't be afraid of your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Eggs. Very, thank you so much. Thank you so much. She's running on something that, uh, that is very important here. You know? Those who, are, those who are not yet married, and you're about to marry, because this thing she wrote is very, very common. We see it all the time. Yes, you are about to marry, but you are not married. It's, look, it's either you are married or you are not married. There is no, I mean, there is no argument about this thing. If you are married, you are married. If you are not married, you are not married. You can be dating, you can be going to movie, you can be drinking together, you can, whatever you want to do, you can do, but you are not married. And if you are married, you are married. Whether you are in the same house or your one is in Congo, the other is in Kafanchan, you are married. Are you understanding me? Until you marry. God said no sex. But God's people are sleeping together even though they are not married. That is, every time you neighbor, that is evil. And now they are afraid. See, see, they are afraid. They are afraid. They are afraid. That's the sin that's all committed. It's, it's a sin. Very simple. God said, the marriage bed, bed is undefiled. No fornication. People of God, you are my people. I am your God. You are my people. You are a peculiar people. You are a holy people. You are a special people. I have separated you unto myself. You are a holy people. Let the world be doing that. But for you, no, no, no. You are a clean, sanctified people. No sex until you marry. That is the instruction from the Lord. But people of God are disobeying it the way they drink water. Let me look at the second one. <laughs> we are preaching it together today. And then you say, ah, but why did you sleep with him? But you are not married. <laughs> Pastor, I didn't want to. <laughs> that woman, uh, I didn't want to. She's the one, she, sed she seduced me. She, he has deflected the blame. Are you a baby? <laughs> she seduced you. She, carried, she, she gave you drug and carried you from the house and carried you on his bed. Look at you. Deflecting blame. Disobedience. God's people disobeying God. That was what Saul did. That was what Saul did. And the justification that we are getting married anyway. Yeah, we are getting married. Pastor, uh -uh, by the next uh, one year we are married though. So what does it matter? We are married. We are, we are, ah, Pastor, we are, I've got to meet their family. Oh. I've got to, I know the father. I know the mother. What has that got to do with the sex that you're having? You are not married. Stay away from sin. Avoid every appearance of evil. That's what the Bible says. When other Christians who have just become saved and still following the Lord and trying to find their way. When they see you coming out of the house of the brother at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning. Ah, hey. Is that not the band in the choir? Not in our, not in our church, oh. Not in our church. No, not in our church, oh. Not here, oh. In another church. It's not in our church, oh. Because our own choir are very, very sanctified. Sanctified. Sanctified choir. Holy, holy choir. Yeah. Anointed choir. Yeah. Amen. God wants us to obey him obedience and then to uh, to admit to repent with God so put it back on the screen and so I said unto Samuel yeah I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and I have gone the way which the Lord has sent me and I have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites but the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been. So he knew. He said it should have been utterly destroyed. 
to sacrifice unto the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You know that God doesn't need your sacrifice. He needs your obedience. That's what we're telling them. He said the Lord doesn't, he's not interested in all the fastings and all the sheep and all the, he wants your obedience first. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Lift up your hands to heaven. God will not reject any of you. Amen. Whatever plan and purpose of God for your life, you will fulfill it. Amen. Your flesh will not do you in. Amen. Your flesh will not do you in. Amen. The grace of God will always be sufficient for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, let us look at David. I will close. That was Saul. If there is something about David that I love, honestly, it is the way that man repented. Or the way he repents. Whenever David does something evil and he wants to repent, his repentance is always somehow. That the thing makes me just love him so much when David wants to repent. When Saul was after, okay, put on the screen, put on the screen, Psalm 51. Put Psalm 51 on the screen. You know, when David wants to repent, he has this unvarnished, complete honesty with God. It does not matter what kind of evil David committed. Once he's come to repentance, he just go before God. He will pour ashes on his head. He will not eat. He will not drink. Then he will begin to talk to God. He will begin to open his heart to God. He will begin to say everything that he has done before God. A man was caught. A man, a man was sent to jail. And he was asked by his uh, inmate in the jail, why are you here? What brought you here? He said, I coughed. Huh? The man said, you coughed. Since when does uh, coughing bring people to jail? Which law is against you coughing? So, yeah, well, when I coughed, the security guard woke up. <laughs> I don't understand. When you coughed, the security guard woke up. So if cough wakes somebody up, should that bring you to jail? Or because best security guard. Why, what, has, what is the connection? Security guard woke up because you coughed and then you are in jail. So well, you don't understand. You see, this, I, I went somewhere. Then I did something there. The security guard was sleeping. Then I coughed. Then he woke up. <laughs> the thing you went to tell you your own. Uh, well, that is where the problem is now. It's not my own. So you went to steal. You gained access to somewhere. Security was there. And because the security man was sleeping, you were able to enter. He said yes. But he was sleeping. He said yes. And you carried things that were not your own. He said yes. Then when you were leaving, you coughed. He said yes. Then when you coughed, the security man woke up. He said yes. And so they grabbed you. He said yes. And then they sent it. Say you are a liar. You have not repented. <laughs> you have not repented. That is not true repentance. With David, David will open himself up and say everything the way it is. Let us read it. Now, this one, this time we're going to read, this was what he wrote after he had been confronted with his adultery with Bathsheba. Written after Nathan the prophet had come to inform David of God's judgment against him because of his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. For those who don't know, what had happened was there was a soldier in David's, David's uh, army. They were at war. The soldiers were in the war front. David, now, 
He was supposed to be at war himself. They said it was at the time that the king went to war. David did not go to war. He stayed at home. When you are supposed to be doing something, you go and do something else. The devil will give you something else to do. Because if he did not stay at home, what happened to him would not have happened. It was the time that kings were at war. He stayed at home. And then the Bible says when he stayed at home, one evening, he saw one baby on top of the roof having a bath naked. So David saw. David now sent somebody, go and grab that woman for me. You know, as a king, in those days, the word of the king was law. The king can kill you. He can take whatever he wanted from you. you could do, the king could do anything. That was how he went and got uh, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, which one is her own? Husband is at war. King wanted me. If I say no, they will kill me. Who am I? I'm just like any property in the land. So she went to king. King entered the room with Bathsheba. Slept with her. Who is laughing there? <laughs> Listen now. Bathsheba got pregnant. David became afraid. And started scratching his head. If this thing, if this woman's stomach begins to grow, they will be asking that, but the man was at war. How did she get pregnant? This woman will trace, they will trace this thing to me. It's okay, I know what I will do. Joab. Joab was the commander general of the army. He said, you know that Uriah, the husband of this woman. Uh, no, no, no. Before, before then, in fact, Uriah actually came home first. Uriah came home. But Uriah, when Uriah came home, David was very happy that, okay, he came home, so they would say that it was him. But Uriah failed, he did not go to his own household. Uriah said, uh -uh, how can my other soldiers be fighting at war and dying? And I will go to my house to go and say, I'm sleeping with my wife. And no, I cannot do this thing. You can see loyalty. His heart was totally for the king and for the kingdom. This man did not go to his home. So he came to the Bible says he went and sat outside in an area where everybody would be seeing him. So David would have said, Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what are we going to do here? Because everybody knows that this man didn't go home. So, how did the woman get pregnant? So he sent a letter. He gave the man. First of all, he greeted him, thank you for fighting for the, for, the, for the country. You are a great man, you are a patriot. Very good patriot, very good citizen. He now wrote a letter to the commander. He said, This man that is bringing this letter to you. Put him in the hottest part of the battle. You see wickedness? He said, put him in the hottest. So he gave it to Uriah. He, Uriah did not know that he was carrying his death sentence. <laughs> and went and gave it to Joab. So Joab read it. I'm sure he must have looked at him. What did you do, you this man? What is it? So they sent him to the hottest part of the battle. Uriah was killed. So, as far as David was concerned, he thought he had escaped. Well, God saw everything. God sent the prophet to him. So the prophet said, uh, David, I want you to tell me how you will decide this, this, how will you decide this case. So, there is a man in this our town. He is very wealthy. He has so many oxen, so many sheep, so many ewes, so many... And then a visitor came to visit him. Instead of him to take one of his own and kill and make for the visitor, he went and took the ewe of another man. And that man had only one. Only one animal that that man loved so much. Only one animal that he devoted his life to. David said he should go and bring it. The man said he should bring it and and kill it, and give it to the visitor of this other man. What should be done to that man? David said, what? <laughs> this is a great evil. He must be killed. Nathan said, you are the man. <laughs> you are the man. He said, God said, if you, he gave you the house of song, he gave you this, he gave you that. If you wanted more, he could have given you more. You went 
and committed adultery. That was not, you took another man's wife. That was not enough. Now you murdered the husband. He said, this thing that you have done, this is how it will end. Then God gave me all the things that will happen to him. Then he wrote this psalm that we are going to read. Put it back on the screen. That Sheba and his murder of Uriah, her husband, loving and kind God. Now, this is David now speaking. And his mother of Uriah, her husband, loving and kind God, have mercy. No, let's, let's make it, let, let it make sense. Go back to the previous verse. Okay, reason after Nathan the prophet had come to inform David of God's judgment against him because of his adultery with uh, Bathsheba and his mother of Uriah, her husband, her husband, loving and kind God, have mercy, have pity upon me and take away the awful stain of my transgressions. This is David speaking, yes? Oh, wash me, cleanse me from this guilt. Let me be pure again, for I admit my shameful deed. It haunts me day and night. It is against you and you alone I sinned and did this terrible thing. You saw it all, and your sentence against me is just. But I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, you deserve honesty from the heart. Yes, utter sincerity and truthfulness. Oh, give me this wisdom. Sprinkle me with the cleansing blood and I shall be clean again. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And after you have punished me, give me back my joy again. Don't keep looking at my sins. Erase them from your sight. Create in me a new clean heart, O oh God. Filled with clean thoughts and right desires. Because he knew what got him there. He knew what got him into trouble. And he's confessing everything before God. Don't toss me aside. Banish forever from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation. And make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to other sinners. And they, guilty like me, will repent and return to you. Don't sentence me to death, oh my God. You alone can rescue me. Then I will sing of your forgiveness, for my lips will be unsealed. Oh, how I will praise you. If we can leave it like that. I can leave it like that. Obedience to God, true repentance and godly sorrow. If you want to be a man after God's heart, if you want to be a woman after God's heart, there are other things I could tell you about David. But one of them is this true repentance and godly sorrow. Anytime David sinned against God and he's confronted with it, he's always repentant with godly sorrow. He goes before God and confesses everything. That is what God wants from you. God is not looking for a magnificent specimen of human being. No. It, there is no such person. But he's looking for somebody when they say this thing is wrong. Not somebody who will argue and argue and argue. Not somebody who will try to justify it and try to justify it and give excuses. Once they show you from the word of God that this is wrong, God wants you to be a man of God, a woman of God, particularly our men. Look, saying sorry to your wife will not kill you. It will kill you. Saying sorry to your wife is not going to diminish your headship. You are still head. Your flesh may go against it. You may not like it, but she's your wife. She's your wife. So saying you are sorry, you know, uh, there's some, some people say, my apologies. No, we don't want my apologies. <laughs> say, I am sorry. I have done wrong. Just, oh, he says, oh, my apologies. No. I am sorry. I have done wrong. I have done wickedly. I have done wickedly against you. I am sorry for this thing I have done. I will try not to happen again. That is true repentance and godly sorrow, not my apologies. Amen. Amen. The Lord will help all of us. Amen. Men, women, children, we will become people after God's own heart. Amen. Those who obey God's word, once you know that this is what God's word says, and those who truly repent when they are shown, when they are confronted with their sins. Let's bow down our heads in prayer.